might take me a minute to get over that one. <clears throat> it's been a, a week for, a couple weeks for women in ministry, so um, it is always a privilege to stand in the pulpit, and I'm thankful to God for his call. Uh, before we get started this morning, I want to introduce you a little bit to myself. He gave you a quick introduction. I don't, did we get pictures up there? Okay, I think we got a couple of pictures. I want to show you. These are my people. Um, this is my handsome husband, Kyle. We've been married for seven years, and then our kids, Olivia, she's five, and Patrick is two, and he's going through what we call um, the terrific twos, because um, I believe, um, I don't believe in Joel Osteen at all, but I do think that maybe we'll just try it, name and claim it. Uh, maybe if we speak positively about it, it'll get better, I don't know, but um, we, uh, we are parenting these two kids, and it's like been kind of a wild ride here recently. Um, it's exhausting. You guys think you're tired right now because you didn't sleep very much last night. You've been studying. But I'm just, I'm here to tell you it gets worse. Um, children, children. Um, also, I think I've got, let me see, I think there's another one of our kid, my kids. Yeah, there they are. That's, I made them dress alike to go to the San Diego Zoo because apparently I'm that mom. I didn't know, but it happened. Um, and then one more. These are, these are the people that I get to serve. Um, I am the pastor of what I call a small but mighty church in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, there aren't a lot of people that fill up the pews on Sunday mornings, but they are the best people. Um, they love God with all their heart, their soul, their mind, and their strength, and they are working so very hard to love their neighbors as themselves. And um, together, we have been serving the people in our neighborhood for the last year, and um, it's just been a really awesome ride together. So now that we know each other a little bit better, um, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word this morning. I'll be reading from Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, and even this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all, for all who exalt themselves will be hum humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Uh, when I came to Trevecca, I actually, I, I graduated from Trevecca in 2007, so it's been a little bit longer than I want to admit. I guess it's been 12 years since I was a student like you. It feels like yesterday, um, but then I remember the whole, like, kid thing, and, and it comes back to me. But when I came to Trevecca, I came from a very loving, uh, kind, well-meaning, but somewhat legalistic church background. Um, in high school, I was publicly praised in my church for casting aside someone who, um, whose lifestyles didn't line up with my beliefs. And, and like every good 90s kid, I, um, I did true love weights. And if you don't know what that is, I'm so glad. But um, it, it, it teaches you that sex is bad and that your body is something you should be ashamed of. And, and I was taught over and over again that if I would follow the rules, all of them, that God would honor that and that I would have a happy and successful life. And so I was the very best rule follower that there was. Like I was a professional rule follower. I took it to a whole new level. Actually in middle school, I remember um, my very best friend from childhood all the way up, we went to the movies one night and our parents weren't there and that was like a really big deal when you're in middle school. And she, she met some boys there and she smoked a cigarette and you know what I did? I went and told her mom. Yeah, I was so cool. I was like the coolest person you could ever meet. Thankfully, though, she's still my best friend, um, and I often remind her that she has me to thank for the fact that she doesn't have a smoking habit. So, um, But I, I legalistically refused to listen to secular music, to watch rated R movies. I was a good rule follower. 
That's probably why I didn't get invited to very many slumber parties. And being a, a hardcore rule follower, it, it lost me some things. It lost me some friends. It lost me some family members that I pushed away. It made me generally stressed out and anxious all the time. And on top of all that great stuff, it also gave me a superiority complex. Yeah, I was committed to following the letter of the law, but I, I lost the heart of it. And somehow that made me feel better about myself while also looking down on all those around me. I got so caught up in doing things, things the right way that I missed real and genuine relationships. It very easily could have been me standing in that temple bragging to God about how good I was. Thank you that I'm not like these other sinners around here. Thank you that I'm not someone who uses those curse words or drinks alcohol or smokes cigarettes. Thank you, God, so much that I am so great. Maybe you relate to that. Maybe it's you standing in the temple saying, Thank you, God that I actually care about the environment. Thank you, God, that I vote for the right people. Thank you, God, that I'm not like Amanda because she seriously skips class like every other day. Thank you, God, that I'm not like the poor, the drug abusers, the prostitutes, bless their hearts. Thank you that I'm not like my parents, the kids I went to high school with, my social media friends. I don't know about you, but for me, pride has been something that I have dealt with seriously for a very long time. When I look back at every area of my life where I have seen where God has shaped me and recreated me and made me more in his image, I can trace it back, and it all began with a moment of pride that he was trying to make new. feeling pride in who I am and what I've accomplished and being better than those around me, pride in my pious faith, in my ability to avoid sin. And this morning as we encounter the Pharisee, he is clearly dealing with an issue of pride himself. When we think of Pharisees, you and I, we associate them automatically with self-righteousness, with hypocrisy, because we've seen this whole thing called the New Testament, and it happens over and over again, and Jesus calls them out for that. But in this day and age, the the hearers of this text, they wouldn't have thought that about a Pharisee. They were people who respected the law. They were respected. They were highly regarded. They were somebodies among the Jewish people. And tax collectors, they worked for the bad guys. They sat at roadside booths collecting taxes from the Jewish people for the Roman government. And they always took a little bit off the top for themselves. They were seen as dishonest, unscrupulous, greedy traitors. They were not the kind of people that you would ever call exalted. So as Jesus tells this parable, the original audience would have probably had feelings of respect for Pharisees and feelings of disdain for tax collectors. And what does Jesus do? Well, he does what he always does, and he flips the kingdom upside down. And he says, the one that you think is exalted will actually be humbled. And the one that you think is humbled will actually be exalted. In our text today, Jesus points out two characteristics of toxic faith that true disciples should attempt to avoid. The first is self-righteousness, and the second is a judgmental spirit. Jesus' parable was addressed to those who were confident in their own righteousness. The Pharisee in this story clearly felt superior to the sinners around him. He specifically mentions robbers, adulterers, and tax collectors. He basically stood up in the temple, and he said, thank you that I'm better than all these people. In his prayer, it was dripping with self-righteousness and arrogance. I mean, he, he fasted twice a week, and they really only had to do it once, and he gave a tenth of his income, and he was a really great guy. But his arrogance cut him off from real relationship with the God that he committed his life to serve. 
His prayer wasn't about communicating with God. It was about letting all those around him know how holy he was. That arrogant religion, it still exists today. There are a lot of religious people in this world who believe that they have figured out God, that they have figured out the church, that they have figured out what it means to be holy, and it makes them feel superior to others. Let's talk about Kanye this morning. You guys know Kanye, right? Yeah? Yeah? Uh, I think I first was introduced to Kanye when I was at Trevecca. Um, I remember riding down Murfreesboro Road with one of my friends, and she was really into Kanye, and we listened to, of course, the edited version of um, Gold Digger. That's right, that was my first experience with Kanye. I, had to, I was trying to tell, tell some of my church people about Kanye this week, and you, I don't know if you saw the picture of him, but I was like trying to explain to them who Kanye was, and most of them were just looking at me like, like, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> so that you all, I, know, I knew you'd know who Kanye was. Um, here are a couple of my favorite Kanye quotes. He said, my greatest pain in life is that I will never be able to see myself perform. I am Warhol. I am the number one most impactful artist of our generation. I am Shakespeare in the flesh. Like, he's pretty full of himself, right? I saw a meme that said, um, I hope that you find someone who loves you like Kanye loves Kanye. And you know what? I truly hope that for all of you in here. I hope you find that kind of love. He actually called himself God. Like he wrote a whole song about how he's God. But last week he dropped his latest album and it's called Jesus is King. And he has expressed a spiritual awakening. He has said that he is born again and that he has been saved by Christ. In an interview, he he actually said, I'm not a theologian. We know. (laughs) But he said, I'm a recent convert. And then he said he'll only make Christian albums from now on. There are no curse words in it. I listened to it on my way here yesterday. There are no curse words in the entire album. Like that's in itself is a shock, right? And I will be the first to admit that his theology needs a little work. Um, But I would think that this is something we should celebrate, right? But do you know what the Christian community has done? We stood in the temple and we judged him. We've judged his confession. We've judged his conversion. We have thanked the Lord that we are not like him. Kanye singing a song that says, Jesus is Lord. Every knee bow, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And we don't believe him. I'm praying that his, his conversion is genuine and that it's real. Because if it is, he has the ability to tell the whole world about our Jesus. If it's real, then he's the tax collector standing in the temple beating his chest. And there are a lot of self-righteous Pharisees unsure what to do with this new Kanye. The answer to self-righteousness is humility. And it seems that sometimes we humble ourselves and sometimes we are humbled. In this parable, Jesus tells us that those who humble themselves will be exalted and those who, have been exa- who exalt themselves will be humbled. We don't know the tax collector's backstory. We don't know what led him to the temple that day, what made him beat his chest and beg for mercy. What we do know is that he went home justified. He went home forgiven. He went home a new person And it was his humility that got him there. This is good news for those of us who have gotten caught up in some kind of performance-based religion. You can stop trying to earn the favor of God because it doesn't work like that. If you're walking around like the Pharisee, dripping with self-righteousness, spewing off every good thing that you've done in your life, bragging about the ways that you've served the Lord, then you are in need of humility. Don't let your self-righteousness stand in the way of your relationship with God and others. If you're like the tax collector, full of shame, regrets, pain, a past that you are not proud of, 
Don't keep carrying that around because Jesus said that he left that place justified. That means he left there without the chains of sin entangling him. He was declared righteous in the sight of God Almighty. He left there a new man. He left there exalted in high regard. Your past does not keep you from the God of mercy. In fact, it could be your past that has led you to the throne room of heaven. In the, in the opening text this morning, Luke is addressing those who look down on everybody else. The Pharisee in the story was extremely judgmental of everyone around him, including fellow worshipers. The tax collector was in the same temple, worshiping the same God, and yet the Pharisee picked him as his target. The irony is that the Pharisee is just as sick and sinful as the tax collector, but he has failed to admit it. How often do we pick apart the people who sit in the same pews as us? If you were to ask someone why they don't attend church, they would probably tell you because it's a judgmental place. Church people are judgy, and they don't want to be a part of that. They don't want to be a part of a judgy place. When someone considers their life and they decide that they would rather live with the pain of their sin than live with the pain of our judgment, then we have missed the mark. And church, we need to cast off our judgmental spirit and take on a spirit of mercy. We need to love people like Jesus loved them. That didn't mean that he let them continue on in their sin. He loved them so much that he offered them a new way of living. No one is going to hear about forgiveness and love and new life if we come at them with a judgmental spirit. We need to trade in our criticism for mercy. Jesus challenges believers to avoid trusting in our own efforts at following the law and instead humble ourselves before a merciful and loving God. We're not supposed to trust in our own strength, but to trust in God's mercy. We live in a world that has got a lot of expectations. You guys walked in this room this morning with a lot of expectations on you. Expectations from your parents to get good grades. Expectations from your, jo- your employers to perform well, to give your, as much of your time as possible. We expect... Um, You have expectations from your professors um, not to sleep in class, which is probably actually a really good expectation. Um, Don't sleep in class. I only did it like once, and I was sick, so to be fair. We We have expectations of our sports teams to never lose, like never lose. We live in a world that tells us that we should perform well all the time, and there is just not room for mercy It isn't found in our way of living. So it's difficult for us to trust mercy. Mercy is having compassion or forgiveness towards someone whom it's within our power to punish or harm. God shows us mercy. God shows the tax collector mercy. And just because there's mercy doesn't mean we throw away the law. Because to be honest, if you want to play a game with me, I'm going to read all of the rules before we start. Because some rules are still important. Being a disciple means walking the balance between law and mercy. It means being able to have mercy for others because of the mercy that has been shown to us. We're set free by the knowledge that because God is loving and merciful, we can leave behind our expectations for achievement. I hope that when we hear this passage this morning that we shift uncomfortably in our chairs at the thought that we could be like the Pharisee. I hope that we are inspired by the humility and vulnerability of the tax collector. I hope that you are moved by the God of mercy the God who redeems through self-sacrifice. Our justification does not come through doing more things. It comes through God reaching out in mercy to us, a helpless sinner. 
When I left Trevecca, I took my first position as a youth pastor in a smaller church. Um, and there, was, there was a lot of power struggle going on in that church. The senior pastor I worked with, he was a good guy. He was a great guy. He had a vision for the, the community. But the people in the church, they just were not ready to see the kingdom of God expand to their corner of the world. I was single. I was lonely. There was no one my age in my church or in my town. I didn't have any friends that were my age and my same stage of life. And I longed for community. Things were not working out like I thought they would. And I took my youth group to our district winter retreat one weekend and um, we worshiped together in a setting much like this and I sobbed. I was in an uncertain time in ministry, an uncertain time in my life, and, and as together we sang the words, your will above all else, my purpose remains. The art of losing myself and bringing you praise. I lost it because I wasn't really sure that I did want God's will above all else. God's will did not seem like a good time to me. And later that night, um, I sent my kids back up into the hotel room and I sat in the church van and I, I just sobbed. And I yelled at God out loud. I'm really glad no one walked by because it would have been really awkward. I listed off all of the good things that I had done with my life, reminding him of all the ways that I had given my life to him. I told him about, I went to Trevecca. I studied religion. I moved six hours away from everyone I knew and loved. Why were things not working out? Why was I not happy? Why was I still alone? I did everything right. And I remember the Holy Spirit whispering to me, you've missed it. It's not about how good you are, but it's about how good I am. Up until that point, I had been trusting in myself. I had been trusting in my ability to follow the rules and I was failing miserably. And it was in the parking lot of a Super 8 motel because youth ministry, that God humbled me and offered me mercy and my life has been better because of it. Legalism limits God. I'm gonna invite our worship team to come up this time, sorry. Legalism limits God, and self-righteousness separates us from God. A judgmental spirit cuts us off from those who we have been called to serve. The good news this morning is that you don't have to trust in yourself. Your goodness is not on trial. You, you are enough. You are are enough not because of who you are and what you've done but because of who God is and what he has done in you be humbled and leave this place justified thanks for joining us for chapel today be sure to check back every Tuesday and Thursday for our next gathering